I am, friends, I am going through some dental karma. <laughs> All my life I never went to a dentist. Now I am going to several. I never lost any of my teeth during my life except by being pulled out by the dentist. They pulled out so many teeth. It had nothing to do with teeth. I was having a total knee replacement in my left knee. Oh, teeth have to be pulled out. What's the connection between teeth and my knee? Nine teeth pulled out. After a few years, second knee operation. A few more gone. A friend from Sweden said he wants to do complimentary implants for me because he likes he doesn't like me when he sees me on live stream with so many missing teeth. He said, okay. He said, I'll coordinate with the dentist here. Three more gone. <laughs> so that implants can come in place. The dentist asked me, how did you live such good life till age 90? I said, I never went to a dentist. <laughs> That's the secret. Now, when I have so many missing teeth, I don't even know if you understand me because the hissing sound will come through. Missing teeth. Nobody has raised his hand. We can't hear you, so I keep quiet. But this is dental karma. But somehow I have started enjoying it. That how are these people so fond of my teeth? Every time I go to one, he pulls out another one. I was talking of karma. Karma is settled before we are born. In India they say, pralabd pehle bani, pache bana sharir. Even before the sperm fertilizes the egg in the womb, the pralabd, the destiny for this life is complete. It's completely made up because the fetus, the embryo, has to grow according to that karma. From the very first point, it has to grow according to karma. How the body of the baby is developed inside the mother's womb is all based upon the destiny already made for that baby, including the period before birth. That is why destiny is a very fundamental thing which creates events of our life. It creates all the things that are going to happen in our life in which we have no control, in which we have no choice. We have no choice where we are born. We have no choice where we die. We have no choice where accidents will happen. We have no choice who we will meet accidentally by chance in our life. So all this is set before and yet some gaps are left in the middle so that we can exercise choice. If everything were completely filled up, then we would never have a choice. We just live with things that are happening one after the other continuously. Little gaps are left in between. Not much. I have studied the lives of various people who come to me to see me and they describe their life. This happened, this happened. And when did they make choices? Some only 10% of their life. Some maximum I ever saw was 30%, one person said, I made many choices, many mistakes. And most of the right choices people forget, the mistakes they remember. Say, I made that mistake, I should not have done that. If I live again, I won't do that, things like that, they told me. These are the gaps where you are now creating a karma beyond the destiny which you came with. So that is why there is a destiny we come with. All those events on which we have no choice are preset completely and we have to go through them. And then there are some choices in the middle where we exercise free will. That means the ability to make a choice. The ability to make a choice does not mean that everything we do is making a choice. Ability to make a choice means there is more than one option open to you. More than one option. You can do this or that. And then you make a choice. That's only a new choice. All others are automatic choices. When you find you can't decide, go here or there, do this or that, 
then you think about it and you deliberate in your mind. That deliberation in the mind and thinking what to do creates a new destiny, creates a new karma. And we call it karaman karma to distinguish from pralabdha karma or destiny. When you create a new one and you make a choice, it has to be paid off. If your mind says, based upon all the all the big powerful influences that have come around you through religion, society, upbringing, all the things that was created by your destiny around you, all those things affect you and say, this is good, this is bad, that's how I should decide. All those affect you and you make a decision and your own mind says, this was good. You didn't make it good. Your upbringing made it good, your religion made it good, your moral friends made it good. Or it is bad. You didn't make it bad. All that influences made it bad. You were born with a soul which did not distinguish between good and bad. There was no difference at all. This was just events. Events to go through. But then this exposure to an experience divided your own choices into good and bad. And it's not always one thing was good at one time and it's bad at another time. It's good for some people who lived 100 years ago. It's bad for us. It is bad for them. Good for us. It changes constantly. So this good and bad is not a final verdict given by somebody. It changes according to where we are born, what's happening, what the culture is, what the religion is. They all determine good and bad. But your mind accepts. When the mind accepts, this was not good. You are inviting punishment for yourself. I did a good deed today. You are inviting a reward for yourself. This filling up of those gaps with karma and karma, with a new karma, determines a future destiny for you, which can be fulfilled in this life or in the next life or the next life or the hundredth life later on. We hear in one of the epic stories in India, there was a blind king and he said he had been able to look through 100 years of his life, past lives, and he could not see any action that he should be blind. The time of Lord Krishna. And he says, Krishna, you say that we get all our blindness and goodness because of past life. I have seen 100 of my past lives through the process you taught me. And I can't see any deed I did which should make me blind. Krishna said, go back further. 104th life, far away. You took out the eyes of a certain person, you're blind for that. Where did those, where did that action of taking out the eyes of a person 104 lives earlier? Where was it staying all the time? That's the third part of karma called the sinchit karma, the reserve karma. We make karma so quickly, so much in the free time we have in our mind that the results are accumulated and kept in reserve. Where is the reserve in our own mind? Mind has a much longer life than this body. And all the karma is stored in the mind. If mind dies, karma goes. When the mind is alive for a million years, two million, three million years of physical time, then all the karma, sinchit karma, reserve karma is stored there. Anything can be pulled out there to make another human life or ant life or animal life, elephant life, dog life. That is a huge reservoir we all have collected. So that is why it's very, very important to know that just doing good deeds in one life will give you salvation doesn't work. A life can be made into something else. Again, taking the leaf from Krishna stories, one of the Krishna stories says that when he was very young, he was still enlightened. He knew a lot, even as a child. He was a cowherd, took care of the village cows, along with his friend Udo. Udo and Krishna used to take the cows out and bring them back in the evening. And one day, while they are chatting, Krishna says to Udo, Udo, it's very difficult to understand the law of karma. Karma is the most fundamental law governing our lives. Karma is creating our lives. Karma is fulfilling our lives. And karma is relentless. 
and he then pointed out at an ant that was crawling. And he said, Udo, look at this ant. Little insect. Once this very ant was Brahma, the creator of this universe. Once it was Indra, which is the lord of one of the big heavens in the astral plane. In spite of such high achievement, which were obtained by the soul, which that became Brahma, because of its very great good deeds for a long time, and got those rewards. When the reward ended, the previous Sinchit karma came in to make him into an ant. So this is very big trap. This cause and effect is the biggest trap. And nobody has escaped from it. Because all our attempts at escape or mental attempts become part of karma. We are advised to perform karma to survive. We can't live life without karma. And the karma is the very thing that is creating problem. Supposing somebody says, I don't want to create any new karma. Now, by the way, that can be done. And I'll explain to you how. I did not know the English words for explaining uh, how to live a life without karma till I came to this country. Somebody spoke those words when I entered. I said, I know the answer now. He said, go with the flow. <laughs> American praise. I said, he's giving the answer. If you go with the flow, you don't create karma. Karma is created when you don't want to go with the flow and want to make your own decision. So that is why go with the flow. Just whatever circumstances come, live with it. Don't make decisions. If any decision is required, ask your friends. Tell what I do. He says, do this, go with the flow. <laughs> supposing you go all your life with the flow. See, I haven't found anybody doing it. But supposing theoretically you could go with the flow all your life. Sinchit karma will come in and create a whole package for next time. It's a very big trap. So that is why it is something so relentless. All efforts we make create new karma. All thoughts of acting create new karma. Karma is never created by physical action. Karma is created by mental action. Because it's in the mind. Karma does not exist anywhere else except in our mind. The good and bad does not exist anywhere else except in our mind. And when we act, it is just a follow-up of the karma. Supposing you think of killing a person, karma has been committed. If you kill him, it multiplies the effect of it. So therefore, karma is created all the time. We are thinking of doing that or doing this. And therefore, we have accumulated a lot of karma. It cannot never be fulfilled in one life. So the next life is only fulfilling part of our karma. So it's... it's it's good to have an idea, a perspective of what we're talking about when we talk of karma. It's not so simple. People say, as my karma ended, if karma ends, you are free. You're free to go home. Karma is keeping us down here. Karma never ends. There's too much of it already accumulated. When a perfect living master initiates a seeker, initiates means accepts him as one for whom he has come. Accepts him for taking him back to his true home. He can accept him. All right, I've come to take him back home. He's perfectly ready. And we'll go back while he is in this physical body. And preferably while the perfect living master is also in his physical body. That's great. List A+. Plus. I never mentioned list A plus earlier <laughs> because I'm going to distinguish from list A now. List A means that he will go back home. There is list B also. List B means you, you have been recognized as a seeker who wants to go to true home, but there are a lot of entanglements that you have with your desires and attachments here. You have to go through them as part of your destiny. Maybe more than one lifetime, but not more than four lifetimes at the most, list B. And then there are many others who are also put on track sometime during the life of those persons in some life. Fifth, sixth, seventh, we don't know which one, depending upon how entangled they are. Karma multiplies because of attachment. When we desire something, 
we like to have it we get it it's finished but when you attach yourself you don't get out of it then you go on coming again and again for a similar thing so that is why attachments create a lot of these entanglements that keep us down longer when a perfect living master comes into our life because we are seekers of the ultimate truth beyond the mind and he accepts us as list a our journey is ended there's nothing to be done after that actually according to me even somebody who has seen the face of a perfect living master even once in a way his journey is ended it will be only a few lifetimes to be here considering we might have lived here millions of lifetimes so that is why even that's a great thing my own dad he was disciple of the great master and this fact that he was a disciple of great master was in a way helpful to me in a way very unhelpful to me it was helpful that i was able to see the great master when i was an infant and therefore i had association with him most of my life unhelpful that gave me thought that i have only met him because of my father and i never got a chance to look around for the right master therefore i was searching for several years about 8 years i spent searching for other masters which i wouldn't have done if i wasn't born in that family so it was something like that but my dad said to me i have learned one thing that this man with the white beard who is a perfect living master anybody who has looked at him even once he may be a person with no faith he is a person who is a drunkard and who is leading a totally immoral life which religion would say disqualifies him for going to god i have seen with my own eyes my dad told me with my own eyes his life undergo transformation by just looking at this one person therefore my dad decided that if he can do the best for any friend of his the best was just take him to see his face he said i don't want to do anything else don't want to tell you anything look at the face of a man and then you can go home and the lives of those people were changed just by looking at him so it was a great experience and i have seen myself that this is a very big change in a person just sometime by looking once that is why in the long journey of our sojourn in several lifetimes here when you once get a chance to look at the face which we call darshan darshan of a perfect living master it's virtually the end of your journey because very soon you'll be going back home but if you if the master happen to look at you with his eyes eyes are a great window showing the power of the soul and attention eyes are being used for attention very much and if he looks at you we call it drishti better than darshan and when drishti is there it cannot be more than four three or four lives just by drishti without initiation without acceptance that you will go with that person the other beautiful thing about perfect living masters is that when you see them and they accept you the responsibility of your going home is completely taken away from you by the master it's not your job how to find your way back home anymore the job of the master to take you back home for him it's not difficult at all because he's operating from the home he's not operating from here at all he is at home when he is here with us and that is why for him is no problem but since the whole creation has been created for the purpose of experiences he allows the creation to continue and we continue to experience our life as it is he is looking at all levels of consciousness as created life created for experiences including this we look at it as the only reality we are living in it's a big difference we cannot live in more than one reality because otherwise it won't be real supposing at this time we could live in two realities one this and one higher reality this will become dream like you cannot sustain the reality of both that is why human beings when they physically determine to go to a higher level of awareness to go to their true home 
they look at this reality, they have to find something here. They find places of worship, temples, mosques, synagogues, all kinds of places to go and look for God, look for reality outside. Rivers, mountains, nature, they find God everywhere because God is everywhere. Consciousness is everywhere. You can't have any experience without consciousness spreading itself and God is totality of consciousness. Therefore, they look for God in the right place, but they can't see God. God has manifested in different forms. Therefore, they search outside. And in that search itself, an outside experience of a perfect living master comes up. An outside experience. And that experience then leads them inside. No perfect living master has ever said that now you start following me. No perfect living master has ever said that go to that particular temple, particular church, particular, and that way you will find God. They've always told you the real temple is the human body. All founders of religion said the same thing. The body is the real temple of a living God. If you want to see a dead God, he is all over. Manifested and remain manifested. You can see manifestation. Or you can see the living God from where manifestation is taking place. He's always inside. The perfect living master directs us inside, tells us where to go, and to find even himself inside. Perfect living master operates from inside. When you are able to go to a very small degree of inner journey, you find him there. The most most perfect event that can happen in human life. When you find your own perfect living master who you saw as a person, human being, ordinary human being inside, is actually a friend of yours inside, because you're still living in a world of division, separation. It's great to have a friend inside. You travel with the friend inside. You talk to the friend inside. He's always inside. Something that had haunted you for several lifetimes. Something called loneliness. Something nobody understands me. Nobody really knows me. Suddenly you find somebody inside who knows you, understands you all the time. Only an extension of your own self, but looks like in appearance, the same person who you saw outside. That such a person should be inside. And that happens the rest of the journey is in friendship. Now imagine if you have that experience of a friend who is there with you inside and you are still here, living here. Friend is always inside. You will never be alone. Everything you do, your friend is with you all the time. After a while, you will not know is he inside or outside or both. Even if he is physically dead outside, you can still see him inside and outside. What an experience. That's a, a friendship. If you want to understand what is friendship, that's the stage when you'll find what friendship is. That's the stage where you find somebody always with you, always supporting you, always understanding you, always becoming yourself and to understand a position. You know, we criticize people very easily. Because we think they are doing something we would not do. Sometimes we criticize even if we do those things and we don't like them, we don't like the other people. Though we can all write doing the same things. This kind of criticism of other people, we are doing because we don't know that the source of creating the other people is ourselves. If we knew that, we couldn't criticize anybody, we couldn't hate anybody. Hatred would disappear the moment you know that. Meditation up to a short distance can give you that experience that everybody is originating from the same source. It's just an experience to divide and make them into many. So that is why meditation, deep meditation, changes your life right here. And if a perfect living master is your friend, always with you, you feel his presence, then you feel you can see him too. Inside and outside. In meditation and not in meditation. You're driving your car, sitting next to you, chatting with you. Of course, don't do it when people are sitting in the back seat. They'll say, "What who are you talking with? <laughs> but it's a wonderful experience to have a companionship 
that lasts forever. Now, when I say forever, it is real ever, beyond this life. Not forever in this life, for any life. Because all lives have been created from one source and you go back to that source. I am mentioning these things to you because there's so much peripheral benefits to get from following a true spiritual path from a true perfect living master. You have come here to join me in listening to these stories of mine, to these experiences of mine with my great master. And I hope you will benefit from all these and make your life, current life, little different. Only one suggestion I give to change your life. Make meditation, discovering yourself with love and devotion, priority number one. Put everything after that. Get up in the morning. First thing is your spiritual opportunity. Meditation. Then do the rest of the things. Never miss this. If you do it every day without fail, it will become easier and easier, more worthwhile than ever before. I wish you best and all the blessings of Great Master with you. I'll see you again next month, those of you who can come here. Those who cannot come, please talk to me. What do they call? Claire Wynsley or <laughs> Talk to me. If you want to send me a message, you can send by email or inner telepathic email. I can tell you both are working. Thank you very much.